So I'll call this meeting to order at uh, 8 a.m. for the uh, Longmont Housing Authority Advisory Board. Welcome everyone to this beautiful snowy Tuesday morning. Uh, Olivia, would you do roll call for us? Sure. This morning we have Tom DeBee, Arlene Zortman, Jean Christopher, and Lauren Sully. We also have Harold Dominguez, Lisa Gallinar, Karen Roney, Kendra Daniels, and Polly Christensen. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome Lauren back too with the new baby girl. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. Uh, can uh, everybody have a chance to review the minutes from our March 16th meeting? Are there any changes to that? <clears throat> I did notice one minor misspelling, which was on the, I believe the second to last page in the, Vacancy age receivables report, second paragraph. <clears throat> uh, Harold Dominguez is uh, with a G instead of a Q. Good catch. I didn't even catch that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear a motion? I think you're on mute, Jane. Second. So Jean made the motion, Arlene seconds. Uh, eyes, please raise your hand. I'm gonna refrain from voting since I wasn't there last month. Okay, all right. <laughs> you abstain, uh, motion unanimously passes. <clears throat> So let's go to number three on the agenda. Uh, public invited to be heard. Olivia, did you hear from anyone? No, okay. So let's go on to number four, new and old business. Uh, A, input on council retreat item regarding Lama Housing Authority. Yes, <clears throat> that'll be me. So um, when we were talking about the retreat with the city council slash housing authority board this year, they, they indicated that they um, wanted to spend uh, the majority of the time on um, housing authority issues. They also indicated that they would like the advisory board to join them during that retreat. So with a couple of provisions, one, um, they wanted to do it in person and they wanted to do it unmasked. So uh, potentially looking at someplace outdoors or close enough outdoors where we can run in if we have a rainstorm if needed. So the dates they're looking at is June, the dates we're looking at to propose to them is June 4th, 5th, 11th, or 12th. Um, but we'll work with them on the specific dates. Um, it's really going to depend on what happens with the masking orders within the next month and um, the, the rules, whether or not we change on May 16th. So we'll be providing you more information on the logistics and the date based on what we hear from uh, the county in terms of whether or not we move into level clear on May 16th or not. Um, what we wanted to talk to you all about <clears throat> is when I, I was working to put together the agenda um, in terms of how we move through housing authority issues. Uh, the way, way I started looking at it was, um, and we're still working on how it sits, but doing a, um, starting off with the presentation of housing needs assessment review. And that's just the study that we've done that says, here's what we need for housing in our community. Uh, then moving into um, a discussion, and we don't want to talk a lot to you all. We want you all to really interact and talk through these things, <clears throat> but um, also providing the city council, the majority of the city council members with some grounding on some of these issues because beyond you and council member Christensen and council member Waters, very few of them have really dug into um, the housing authority items. And so what we wanted to do was start off with um, 
and we're still working on the order of this, but um, the, an overview of the housing choice voucher program, um, specifically talking about um, the, uh, the vouchers and the partnerships that we have with private property owners. Um, the, um, and I'm seeing a lot of, acronyms in here, the project-based vouchers um, that are connected with developments. Uh, and then also um, looking at some of the ARPA impacts and some of the vouchers that will be available through that process. Um, what we want to talk about in that section, or, or then we want to move into the properties the types of properties that we have in the development. So go over um, the LIHTC property, properties for older adults, properties for families, the HUD 202 properties, which we have with the um, Hearthstone and Lodge, um, and then supportive service pro or properties with supportive services for uh, persons exiting homelessness that need more intense supportive services, then the different types of partnerships, um, tax exemptions, property management, tax credits, turnkey, and then how that combines with the uh, inclusionary housing, land donation, or partnership piece. Um, and, and, then, and then going into a conversation on what we should be doing, AMI goals, what are the goals for vouchers, do we increase the number of type of vouchers, what populations do we target? Um, how should project-based vouchers impact or support project development? Getting into some development goals, what is our mission with respect to supportive housing? Uh, what number and type of units should we be shooting for? Do we give priority to LHA properties for city, city funding and in, uh, inclusionary housing projects and other support? Um, talking a little bit about partnership goals, what level of partnership do we want to focus on? Money generation, unit generation, unit ownership. Um, and then get into a different opportunity section, um, really focusing on affordable assisted living or for sale housing development. So that's kind of what we put together is the talking points. Again, we're still really structuring this agenda to where it may flow and make more sense and it's easier to talk through, but I wanted to, to throw that out to you all to say, um, is there anything that you all would like to discuss with the uh, council during this um, retreat focusing on the housing authority? Um, anything that we missed, anything that we think we probably shouldn't talk about? So now the floor is yours. You probably covered this a little bit, but I guess my question is, does the city have data on what is really uh, critical right now as far as housing goes? Is it seniors or is it families? What, what are we looking at here? So we do, and that's in the, and I'll ask um, Kathy and Karen to join in with the housing needs assessment review. I think one of the things I can tell you that we've seen is at least in terms of the portfolio for the, the housing authority to compare what we need. We think we're probably um, where we need to be in terms of housing for older adults and we need to start focusing on family. Family housing is part of the housing authority portfolio. Um, and, and that's, I think I mentioned it in here. And then obviously supportive, um, um, supportive services, housing. The thing on the supportive services side, so then it comes, it becomes more than just about the amount of units that we have and do we have enough for a community, but it also then ties into what can we support as a community because they not only utilize services of the housing authority, they utilize services from our nonprofit community, public safety and those types of things. And so there's a different, there's other variables that come into that world. But I would say my gut was, what I would tell you is we probably need more uh, affordable family housing. Erin? So, you know, so Kathy might want to jump in, but um, it, you know, when we complete the consolidated plan for HUD every five years, 
um, you know, part of that process is to uh, conduct a, um, you know, a comprehensive assessment of, of housing and human service needs. So we did just complete that in 2020. So, um, so I don't know whether that would be helpful. Obviously, we'll provide that document as part of the um, packet that we put together for council. And I don't know whether, I mean, it sounds like it might be helpful if we, um, you know, sent the the advisory board members um, a, a copy of that information and um, so that you can have a, a chance to look at that and review that. So um, let's see, we're still in April, right? So, cl so clearly we will lose track of time. Um, so clearly uh, June will be the earliest that we will have the council retreat. So it also could give you an opportunity to review that data and we could have this discussion in more depth during the May um, advisory board meeting. So Kathy, I don't know if you have anything else you'd add. I don't. That's what I was going to suggest. That way we would still have time if there are some pockets of things that are missing that we could do some additional research as well. <clears throat> I just had one thing and I didn't quite, I don't know if I heard it or not. It would just be like the discussion with the partners that we do have, uh, you know, like the mental health partners, like the number of units that they would have. I think that would just be kind of uh, going along lines with, with our property discussion as well. Okay. Are you talking about the vouchers that they get from the state in terms of the project, the project based right. vouchers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause we have units set aside specifically for them. Right. Correct. Yep. Yep. Any further discussion, questions? Oh, go ahead, Karen. So, yeah, so in not a question, but I think in, in essence, you know, what Harold outlined is that um, so so we'll, you know, we'll talk about the current housing needs. We will talk or current and projected housing needs. And then, you know, what is it that the housing authority does now to address those needs? And then it's really that conversation about um, what would be the, the goals going forward. So um, as we understand the, the ongoing needs that we will have for, you know, for housing. So it, you know, it would be great. And again, this doesn't have to be the last time we talk about this, but if, you know, how do you, um, is, is there additional information, anything else that you think would be really helpful for us to um, bring to that council retreat to help in that discussion really about setting goals going forward? Okay. So anything else that comes to mind? So how about we do this? If anybody has goals now, we could discuss it now. Else what we could do is put something on the agenda for our May meeting and we could discuss our goals. That would give us time for the retreat and we could uh, kind of have something on the table at that point. Go ahead, Laura. I was curious, um, do we have an inventory of affordable housing for purchase? I mean, does the city of Longmont have properties um, kind of like the city of Boulder's affordable housing program where you can purchase and own? an affordable housing unit that stays in the program, kind of like Thistle. That, I know Thistle has some, some units in Longmont in houses. Yeah, the so, so we have some, authority. so we have some at Blue Vista uh, that's under construction right now um, or completed. They have a total of 26, they've sold 11 through 2020. So that leaves 15-ish um, that was left. And I think they've been consistently selling two to three per month. Um, out there. <clears throat> we have a turnover of the units that are still in our um, inclusionary housing program the first time. I think there's about 30, 20 to 30 homes still left in that, um, that program um, that can choose. So those units can choose to either get out of the program and sell at market, or they can choose to stay in and sell to another buyer. We've had some go both ways. Um, and then so far under the inclusionary housing program to date, um, other than Blue Vista, we haven't received any um, for sale on site units other than through Habitat 
um, through uh, Habitat for Humanity. Those units aren't built yet. There's a total of about 20 that are going to be coming up um, over the next probably three to four to five years. Um, but Habitat has been also been consistently building um, at about the rate, I'd say two to three a year, um, just on their own by infill lots and that kind of thing. So yeah, it'd be nice to know, um, have some more information about those units. Um, and I'm curious why people are allowed to opt out of the program. It seems like we'd want to keep houses locked that, in yeah, um, that was forever, council, like the that, city of Boulder's yeah. program. Well, when um, they repealed the inclusionary housing program, that was the caveat for the units that were in at that period of time. So I think it'd be worth discussing a different a different track for the future if we start building more affordable housing. Yeah, we're totally on a different track. Yeah, unless unless yeah. it gets repealed again, council can do that. <laughs> yeah, I just think that if we're if the mission is really to provide permanently affordable housing, you shouldn't be able to opt out of it. <laughs> so um, the other thing yeah, I was so, thinking. Oh. So to clarify on that, we were on a path, council opted out of it, or they killed it, op they let them opt out of it. We're now back on a path. And they're okay. in it. Okay. They did set some parameters depending on market. So we're sort of back where we were, but there was a chunk of time where we lost between the two where they were able to opt out. Okay. Yeah, because I think that that's a really, um, I think that that's something we should focus on and talk next month about, you know, a plan for housing for families, not just apartments or condos, but maybe some townhomes, something with a yard, because uh, I know when I'm my husband and I were looking um, to transition out of affordable housing in the city of Boulder. Our only options were condos and we were looking to expand our family and needed more space. Um, so I think that that would be something worth looking at, maybe like a mixed um, mixed units, you know. So as a point of clarification, are you suggesting that's an LHA goal? or that's an overall citywide goal? I, well, I, just... I, think, I think it's an LHA goal, but it's in line with the city's goal of providing affordable housing for the community. Okay, I just wanna point out LHA has never done for sale housing. So if that's a direction you wanna go, I would think long and hard about that because that's a, that's a big shift. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Arlene. On the uh, veterans housing that is being put together, is that something that we are involved in or is that um, not? LHA is not involved in that. Um, it, it came in through the voluntary alternative agreement via the inclusionary housing model. So, so the city is, is involved in that as part of that agreement. Now, um, we think that there's, um, now there's, on the other side, we are looking at leasing the office space to them so that they can utilize it and we can serve the same mission. So we talked to you all about that. So you're involved on that side. I will say that as you look at the growth of the program and you look at how it operates, um, we're going to be working with each other from an operational perspective because as they potentially have opportunities to house um, unhoused individuals, there may be a flow through properties that makes sense as, as they're working with their clients to, to move towards self-sufficiency. And that's what you see in Kansas City. So they'll come in, they'll work with them, they'll move them into an affordable housing. And then now they're actually seeing them move into market rate housing um, based on how they're, they're working them through their system. So there's a slight connection. Any other further discussion on 4A at all? So I think what we'll do is we'll kind of come up with our goals. So that's kind of your, your homework assignment and we'll discuss a little bit further in our May meeting. Um, so let's move on to 4B, the audit update. Was that Kendra? Um, 
So right now, um, most of the properties have been completed except for Aspen Meadows um, senior apartments. They're still working on finalizing that one. The, we did receive some findings for the Hearthstone and the Lodge and we're working through the corrective actions for that. Um, a lot of them you've seen before. Um, I don't know how much, um, I don't know if you've guys, you guys have seen um, all the audits before. Um, I don't know what the background is on that. Um, so part of it is separation of duties, um, lack, of, lack of segregation. Um, we also had an audit finding because when the city came in, we didn't realize that it wasn't in their monthly process to pay the reserves. So we received a finding on that because the Hearthstone and the Lodge hadn't been putting money into the reserve accounts. And with the cash flow, with that being so rent restricted, it was tough for us um, to, to get payments in by the end of the year, by the time we found out. Um, the other one, we did have some eligibility, which we've had in the past, um, which is just, they weren't able to find documents in the files that were signed. Um, so we have, so we're working on the corrective actions. We do have a plan and I think we have, because we're going to have three in accounting and we're also going to try to have um, backups on the city side of accounting so that we can have, if somebody's um, designated to print checks, then somebody from the city will step in to print checks that week if that person's out. So that's kind of what we're kind of looking at so that it's not me. So it's, and that's where the problem comes is like, we can have the separation with the three, but once one goes on vacation, one of us has to be the backup. Um, so we are working on that. Um, we're all also looking at um, being able to do file reviews. So having community managers from different properties come in and do file reviews so that um, we can pass those. One of the things was that they couldn't find a checklist in the file. So we should have a checklist, especially for the 202 properties um, that basically say, we have everything for these 202s that HUD requires. Um, and so they couldn't find those in the files. There wasn't that checklist. HUD has a checklist that um, Andrea is working on and creating um, so we can start having those in the, the file, along with maybe having the other community managers step in and review each other's files so we have that documentation um, for when audits come down and they, and they get reviewed. Um, we are working on the LHDC audit right now. That's in full force. And then the LHA audit is planned for May 17th. That's when that one will start. Um, so that's kind of where we stand. No, I can send all those audits. I don't know if that's something that's normally done in a, in a particular board meeting where you get to look at all of them or if this is something that once I get the final ones, I send them to you. Can you, If you can give me some background, that would be great. Yeah, I think once we get, we'll do like <clears throat> we do the council, once we get it finalized and it's all in, then we'll present to the, to the board. Okay. Um, one of the things I did want to touch on with Kendra, so I've been seeing these as they're coming through. Um, she has to approve them and I have to approve them. Um, the biggest challenge, just to go in, in terms of some of the findings like segregation of duties, Tom, <clears throat> I know Tom mentioned this last time, you all mentioned it when we sort of started coming in to the meetings. Um, if you will remember, we didn't start hiring the positions because we had to understand our financial capability first. And so we didn't start hiring and, and creating all the accounting positions until late uh, 2020. And so obviously this audit is for that year. So we've already began taking the corrective actions, but it won't show up until next year's audit because we're not bringing those people into play. We didn't bring those individuals into play. We didn't get Lisa in until the beginning of this year and, and the other property managers. So many of those items that like you'll see that the corrective action is we're really underway in doing this uh, same with the segregation of duties um, what i can tell you is it's at the end of 2020 it was much better than it was at the beginning of 2020 because not only did we have kendra in we had susie in and we had deanne in so we had three different people working in the finances but it just wasn't fully developed and built out so 
that that's why that's continuing. But we know that as Kendra indicated for 2021, we have our three. And then when someone's on vacation, we'll just pull someone in from the city's accounting side to, to make sure that stays in play. The other key piece that Lisa talked about yesterday, um, and if you have questions, I'll let you go to Lisa, is Lisa actually has each one of the property managers um, auditing the files of the other properties. So Corinne will audit Andrea's, Andrea will audit um, Corinne's, and so we're, we're mixing it up. So we also have a, another set of eyes on that, and Lisa's overseeing all of that work. So um, I'm pretty happy with, with the, where they're moving and what we need to do. But again, we're still going to catch audit findings from 2020 because if you look at the timing, I think we started the conversations in May, April or May, but we really didn't fully get into this until June when Jillian left. And even then, we were still utilizing the same processes. So that's why there were things in there because they were doing it this way. We didn't catch it until much later. Um, and we're continuing to, to clear up all of those issues. Did I misstate anything, Kendra? Yeah. Just a point of clarification. Is this our financial audit or a HUD audit? Financial audit. Financial audit. That's what I was assuming. Okay. And then, so I just kind of had two points. Um, what I'd like to see is just in that corrective action plan um, is just calling out, hey, we've already covered this or maybe even put a date in that, that we've uh, instu instituted a policy change in, um, and this has been corrected. I think that's, that's really what we would be after. Um, yes, we had findings because we didn't have the manpower or we didn't have policies and procedures in place. Um, and then the other question I did have, do we have documented policies and procedures or is that still kind of a work in process? How? Um, for what? <laughs> Well, basically, yeah, I guess this would, some of this would be, uh, the segregation duties would be on the uh, check disbursements. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, okay. We're working on that right now. We have a lot of them in place, but we're and continuing probably, to uh, refine. Yeah, it's probably changing as, as you work through it as well, as you're getting stuff fine-tuned in that. Kathy? I was just going to say we've been standardizing a lot of processes and updating a lot of policies and procedures. So that's like a, at least one a week, if not more, that we're kind of churning out. And financial ones are going to the LHA board and um, internal organizational kind of ones. Harold has the ability to review and approve. So, Yeah, and that's what the auditors are really going to be after. And if you fall on your policies and procedures you're not going to have any findings. So yeah. right. that's it. Yep. And then also in the segregation of duties, what I didn't mention is you also have um, Deanne and Jim Golden coming in and helping as we look at things and, and start working through various issues. And so, for example, the best examples, as we look at balance sheets and how we do it, um, they're, they're there supporting Kendra in this because Kendra technically works for Deanne and Jim. So you also have, or, um, or the city CFO coming in when needed. Um, Kendra's doing a fabulous job. So, but he comes in on a limited basis, but both Deanne and Jim are there to support her when we need it. That's great. It's basically having like an external CFO, right? That you on call? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, any further discussion on this? All right, let's go on to uh, 4C, the VCA update. So I am happy to report everything that needed to be submitted to HUD has been submitted as far as policies, um, proof that we have disseminated those to residents. We've got packets for new applicants. We've got some of the policies and procedures up on the website. Um, so that was all due April 15th, and we got that all completed. The only thing left to do, only, it's still a big lift, is the analysis of all of our properties um, for accessibility, designing a plan to address those, and then determining with HUD how we're going to do that. Um, we've already started to um, 
work on getting additional UFAS, the um, special ADA accessibility units that um, we, we need and don't have um, through some various partnerships. Um, so one of the deals that we're working on with um, on the Chrisman 2 project, they're going to double the amount of UFAS units in that um, property, which we will then eventually have ownership of. Um, so that will count um, for some of those units that we know we're going to be missing when we do that um, analysis and audit. So we're already thinking ahead on how we can get some additional units. And then as we go through, <clears throat> as our properties age and we go through and do another resyndication rehab like we did for Aspen Meadows Apartments, um, Village Place is next, and then I think Aspen Meadows Neighborhoods after that will be also be including in that additional UFAS units in, in those renovations and rehabs wherever we can. So um, starting to think ahead, but we don't have um, the plan, we don't have the analysis of that. That's the next lift that we need to start working on, which will happen probably next month. We'll start putting together and getting out an RFP um, for an architect to go around and analyze the properties. But half of it's done, about half. <laughs> That's good news. And obviously that piece got delayed because of COVID and being in people's units. And so when we did get the extensions there that we needed to because of that. Any questions or discussion? All right, let's go on to uh, 5A, city report update on operations. Lisa, is that you? So vacancy age receivables report? Or is it Kendra? I can definitely speak to the age receivables report. I wanted to do something different this month and kind of give you a snapshot of what you received last month and what you're receiving this month. So you can kind of see um, the fluctuations and the differences. The community managers have started working on the ledgers. I've been working with them. They have to send the documentation to me on their findings of what they're finding in the file um, so that I can upload that documentation when I do the corrections. A lot of what we're seeing is um, Yardi just wasn't doing the lease charges correctly and they weren't getting them corrected in the system. So what was happening is you may have been overcharging on the HAP side and undercharging on the tenant rent or vice versa. So in, in, in a sense, it's a zero net effect it's just on the wrong ledgers. Um, and when it's on the wrong ledgers, it creates these anomalies such as the suspense column. The suspense column is specifically rate, related to HAP, basically that you've received HAP money that you don't have a charge for, so you really should probably send this HAP back. Um, and that was probably not the case. We just had the wrong charges on the wrong ledgers. So it's moving those charges to the right ledgers um, and seeing what the anomalies are for the tenants you know, were they, sh were they short paying this, this entire time and why and going through those. Um, so same thing with the prepayments. If the charges aren't listed on the tenant's ledger, it's looking like they're prepaying all these funds and they're not, it's just a, a, ledger, sw a ledger swap. So we are working through those. Um, it's gonna be a long process because <laughs> It takes a long, I mean, a lot of these have to go back to 2018 because that's when they started. Um, so they're having to re review all the way back to 2018, find um, the recertifications, what were they? We're having to reach out to the HAP subsidy agencies because we may not have a certification in, in the file because we're seeing that they've actually taken money back and we don't know why. Um, so there's a lot of work involved, but it has started and you can kind of see um, some of it is going down. So we're getting there. So question on this, Kendra, is this uh, like the suspense and prepayment, should some of that necessarily been recognized as revenue then? Are we shorten the revenue side or? Um, it, it could be. Okay. Um, so so if, if they were charging less rent, so let's say they charged $1,000, but they really should have been charging 1200, we could not have been recognizing um, revenue correctly. Um, right. So yeah, that is- Because the way I see it, it, this is money that we received that we haven't matched against anything, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and a lot of the prepayments could be, they the tenant owed more and they were paying more because they received their certification letter. So they were actually paying the correct rent, 
But in Yardi, we weren't charging the correct rent. We were charging that rent on the HAP subsidy side, which was creating the suspense and then also creating a prepay um, on the tenant ledger. So just swapping those and matching them up removes them from the ledger. Yeah, okay. And then one other question too that I had was just, just on the prepayments. Are we expecting to see prepayments normally? Do we collect, I mean, the no. deposit, would the deposit show in there or any sort of like last month's <laughs> rent? We would expect that to be zero? The deposit shouldn't show up on there because that gets put in a separate holding account. Right. Right. Um, so that shouldn't show up there. And no, I mean, no, we shouldn't see prepayments on these. I mean, these are low income housing. A lot of them aren't prepaying. Um, I know there was maybe one that might have been prepaying <laughs> um, at the suites. <laughs> Um, so, so I think also at the community manager level, we don't want that liability either. So if they are prepaying, you know, the community managers need to reach out and say, Hey, you don't owe us, you know, you need to reduce your rent check so that we don't have this big liability at the end to pay them out. Um, we're not a savings account basically <laughs> for them to hold their, their money on. Then did you want to talk about the lodge and what happened there? Yeah, so the lot, you got to love HUD. So we received a 14% increase in our vouchers for the 202 properties. The way HUD works is they create a threshold. And so what happened is when we did the gross rent change to increase those contract rents, we weren't able to get them done at the end of the year because we didn't have the contracts in time. When you do these 202 properties, you actually create the voucher for the future month. So that voucher was already created um, on December 8th for January. So what happened on the lodge and it happened on the Hearthstone as well is when we went to do the gross rent change, it goes back to January and it tries to correct what should have happened on those ledgers as well and get that HAP money back in. Well, that put it over the threshold for um, HUD. And so they denied the voucher. And so I have to work through this process on how to correct it in the system and get it uploaded so that they'll approve it. Um, it it's kind of as Lisa has found out, HUD sends you on this little circle path a lot. Um, I've had to do, uh, so they first rejected it, then they sent me to the program manager. Now they said it's ineligible and they basically said, here's the instructions on how to correct it. So I'm working through that. <laughs> um, they don't give much guidance, but um, I think even Yardi will probably give me more help than the Yardi support will give me more help than HUD has. So um, we'll get there. Um, so February's lodge payment was denied. It's, it's going to get paid. We just have to work through the processes. And then for the Hearthstone, it was their April payment because it took a while. We had two contract rent changes. They gave us an amount. I went back and said, we can't even pay the reserves. And the program manager realized they left the reserves out of the rent calculation. So they had to up the rent again. So we'll see the same anomaly happening on the Hearthstone. Um, for their April voucher. So I just wanna add because of this issue and mm -hmm. the <clears throat> audit that we went through, just got um, our report back on the audit for Hearthstone and Lodge. We are exploring all options to get out of the 202 program. Um, there is an avenue that HED provides to do that. Um, the level of minutia that HED gets into on these projects is so ridiculous. Um, it is, it, it's just mind boggling. Um, I haven't seen HUD this bad in a project for years and years <laughs> and years and years, if ever. Um, and, and they're usually pretty bad. So <laughs> we are um, starting to explore how, how do we get, um, convert these projects. Um, what they do is they convert them to all being project-based um, vouchers. So then you have the control and you, you operate them just like you would any other property that has project-based vouchers. So we are moving on that as quickly as we can. I think there's a wait list to get on that conversion. So we're trying to explore um, 
what all that means and how long that might take. But this is, that's a, a direction that we really feel we need to go. So we'll keep you apprised. Uh, if we did switch it over to the project-based vouchers, would we see a decrease in money coming from HUD at all? Or is it going to be about the same? It would be the same. From what, from what our consultant said is that basically your contract rent, so whatever your contract rent is today, it would move over to the project-based vouchers and that would be your contract-based rent as well. But what yeah. you don't have to do is you don't have to go through this budget process of where you're spending your money and give them all the details and you don't, you don't, your money doesn't apply to the, ha the HUD handbook, which is pretty extensive um, on all the regulations that you actually have to follow. So what we're also saying is we never want to do another 202 property if we're developing <laughs> it. That, that was going to be one of my goals, though. I've <laughs> <laughs> lost uh, the agenda. Age receivables. I think it was next. Uh, so I did the age receivables. I think the vacancy report, did, Lisa, did you want to report out on that one? Anything else on that one? So on the vacancies, we're making progress. Um, really been pushing the managers and the assistants to get these units rented. So Spring Creek is fully rented. Um, Village Place, I think as of last night, she had her two that were not rented, vet rented as well. The Lodge and Hearthstone's fully rented. So we have move-in scheduled starting today all the way through um, May 5th that will fill up all these properties again, finally. <laughs> Let's see. And the suites, the LHA units have been rented. They have a briefing today for the second unit. We're just waiting for MHP to fill their units, which they're, they are struggling going through DOH because they have to pull 20 names at a time and then make sure that those 20 qualify. But some of them, they've had changes and stuff that make them ineligible for the suites. So it's been a process. We're slowly getting through those. And Aspen Meadows Senior, now that um, it's been a little bit of a struggle to rent those vacancies, just with all the construction going on, people want to see the units. It's hard to have them walking under scaffolding around the construction crews. There's not a lot of parking, but um, I'm optimistic as we're moving forward um, that we'll be able to get those other units leased once we get back into the office so that we're more available to prospects as well. Any questions on the vacancy report? All right, let's move on then to uh, 582, the security update. Is that me? <clears throat> so um, we have been, a couple of things. We have had some issues on um, security at Village Place. So we've done a few things. Uh, first, we have entered into an agreement with Integrity Fire and Security Systems that are the city's provider. So we we're able to tap into that, um, that contract. They are in the process right now of um, placing the cameras at various locations within the Village Place um, common areas. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly on what the completion date is. I know that when I walked through there before, all the conduit and camera mount locations were, were almost final, finalized. The other thing that we did is because we, we were able to also find out that the back doors on that facility, they were able, somebody was able to come in and push the lock. So we um, used another city contractor and they went ahead and put the, the plates that they cover it to prevent access in that area. So um, we know we've, we've stopped the immediate issue and the cameras will be put in play, be finalized in the very near future so that if, if we have that again, um, we'll, we'll be able to at least have the video we need. Part of what we're doing on this system is it's gonna be a cloud-based system. Um, and so as we've worked the remodel for Aspen Meadow Apartments, we're gonna put the same system in place there. And, and we're talking about putting uh, that system in, in Aspen Meadow neighborhood as well. The re where we're really aiming to on some of the security pieces is to integrate this all into one cloud-based system 
where we, we would all have access to it as well as um, um, potentially dispatch and maybe some of the officers. So if needed, if there were calls and things, they, we could go into the system remotely from wherever we are, but it'll be a completely integrated system amongst all the properties. And we're sort of just stepping into this as, as we have money available to do it. Um, obviously we, we use the replacement fund at Spring Creek to do this just because of the issues that we were having there. Um, and, but we'll, we will just be moving through this as we can for the rest of the properties based on their ability financially to do this. Lisa, did I miss anything on that? Um, just a slight correction. We're using Village Place Reserve replacements to do Village theirs. Place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we're looking into doing Spring Creek, getting some yeah. entry cameras <laughs> in the parking yeah. lot. Uh, also on security, we are working to upgrade some lighting at some of the properties as well through grants with the City Efficiency Works. Um, we sent in proposals yesterday for the Suisse and for Aspen Meadows neighborhood to upgrade their lighting. They will be, they walked Briarwood and LHA Main yesterday and they'll be doing Spring Creek and Fall River Thursday. Um, and so these grants will pay for all of the lighting and it upgrades them to LED, but provides more luminous lights throughout the parking lots and around the exteriors of the building for the safety of the residents. Any questions? All right, let's move on to into a 5A3 property updates. I guess I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, and I'll jump in after you. <laughs> okay, so we do have an ad out for the third manager. We haven't received any great resumes, so we're going to keep that ad up looking for our third property manager to complete the staffing that we need at LHA. In the interim, I've been still filling in here at Spring Creek and Fall River twice a week. Um, we are bringing the after hours emergency system that we've been using at all of the properties, the always an answer. We are actually bringing that in-house things to the city and following the steps of forestry and parks and rec. So we'll be saving money on all of the properties monthly and it makes a more one-on-one -on -one maintenance dealing directly with the residents instead of an answering service. And we start that here the first week of May. And as Kendra touched on, our managers have been auditing these ledgers and making it through a couple ledgers a week. It is a timely process, but they're all gung-ho about getting their yardy systems cleaned up and um, making just their delinquency reports look really good in the future. So I know Corinne has a goal of having hers done by June or July. Andrea is right on page with that. And I've started working with... Um, Brittany here at Spring Creek and Fall River to get those ones done. Now a and question then, on that, are they reviewing every single file or are they just doing a sample? Every single file, every contract. So if the resident had multiple changes throughout the year, they have to look at every contract and every month to match up to make sure the charges were correct on both the HAP side or the voucher side, section eight side and on the um, resident side. So it is a timely process. And some of those can take days in between regular business to look at. And my final update is tomorrow we get the equipment installed at the Hearthstone and the Lodge for the pendant system that will replace the pull cords. So the fire department is looking forward to that one because the residents will have kind of like the alert system instead of just the pull cord. And the, sorry, the alert system works throughout the community in their units throughout the community and in the parking lot instead of just the pull cords in one area of the residence. Lisa, do you also want to touch on some of the, um, even though they're reserve replacement, but some of the work that we've done at some of the different properties, as well as, um, I don't think we've given them an update on the, the latest suites um, insurance issue, um, the water break thing and where that stands. So yes, the suites, we have completed that um, construction issue. We're working to get heaters put into the stairwell. So to avoid this problem happening again, when we have the low temperatures as well, but the resident who was temporarily living in another unit on site has been moved back into our residence. Um, and we've completed that. The, we're just pending now the finalization of the insurance claim and a few invoices to close that one out. Reserve replacements we're working on for village place for the cameras, along with a couple appliance replacements going on there. And the next one we're looking at is Spring Creek to do some reserve replacements for their camera system as well 
as Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Any questions? I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm having horrible allergies today. I have a couple of updates. So um, one of the things, the parking lot at um, Aspen Meadows Apartments, um, that parking lot is is still open. One of the, the issues that we're having is the, the uh, moisture test um, keeps coming back high. And so they're working with the engineers to really determine how much material we need to replace um, in order to get that mo moisture content where you need it in your subsurface so that you can then begin the paving. Um, obviously, the weather we've been having recently is not helping matters in terms of the moisture content. So um, it looks like there was reserves available to do this. And, and so that's what they're working on. Um, we were starting to, based on where we were moving and the, and the amount of money we had, look at other options. Um, but this, um, this parking lot is going to continue to be a challenge for us. I um, just wanted you all to know. But. So is that going to eat up then the contingencies <clears throat> that we had planned on with Aspen Meadows? Partially? Yeah. yeah okay. No, yeah. Um, the other thing we're working on, and this is really tied to some of the ARPA funds and, and the digital divide world in terms of Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Um, you all may know that we are also connected to the via next slide to the school district on a million dollar grant that they had. When I started looking at the coverage area, this area for Aspen Meadows neighborhood was in it. Um, a few weeks ago, Lisa and I did a walk around with next slide looking at what we can do for camera placement um, in that area, but also started talking about um, internet access. And so I have asked them for um, a, a bulk agreement uh, for Aspen Meadows neighborhood to provide internet service there. Uh, we actually were able to get them into the units and they have a really good comms room. So they're looking at, instead of um, the way they've been connecting the units when asked, moving into the comms room to essentially light up the entire unit. So they have um, really hardwired access throughout the unit in addition to Wi-Fi. Um, so we'll be working on that. I'm kind of looking at some of the ARPA funds or CARES funds that we have available to front that digital divide piece. And then we will have to eventually be able to, over time, absorb that within the rent. Um, but I think if we give ourselves three, three to five years, um, that we can do that um, because the ARPA funds are one time. So, <clears throat> but that's at the, uh, that's at the neighborhood. All right, seeing no hands. Uh, let's go on to number six, other business. So on other business, a couple of things that we wanted to update you on, and we've been working on this. So you heard Kathy mention the uh, Christman II project. Um, wanted to touch on that one a little bit. So what happened there is recently we heard um, that MGL, who was a developer of Christman 1, was actually um, interested in development of Christman 2. It appears that last year, or you know, within the last year, year and a half, uh, they approached um, the housing authority with interest in doing the second phase. Um, we're not sure what happened, but apparently the decision was not to move forward with that project. Um, we have engaged in conversations with them um, based on just the opportunities that exist today. And so we have been um, negotiating with them over the last couple of months on what Christman 2 would look like. Um, as you all may remember, um, the Housing Authority had an option on Christman 1 to come in for $100, correct, Kathy? Kathy? and essentially take over the facility and begin the management on this. Um, again, not really sure what happened when this first deal was there. Um, I think there was a, a situation when they used um, CDBG DR funds instead of the original financing, financing model that um, impacted their bottom line. So as we began discussions on Christman 2, 
Um, what we've essentially noted, uh, negotiated is a later date to, to come in um, and, and officially take the properties. So, um, but it will be not only Christman 1, it'll be Christman 2. Uh, and so that looks like it'll be at the end of 2027. Um, we have the ability to come in and manage the properties at an earlier date once they, uh, what's the word, Kathy? Um, reach stabilization. Reach stabilization. Once Christmas 2, two reaches stabilization. Um, and so once Christmas 2 reaches stabilization, even though we're going to 2027, which helps in terms of the ongoing dollars, but what we also negotiated in this is that... Um, we um, adjusted the revenue split on Christman 1 because we know we would be losing money if we came in in 2023 as the management arm. Um, but we also know the world we're in now and what we're trying to stabilize. So um, for Christman 1, until we take the properties over, we've shifted the revenue split from uh, I believe it was 60-40. Uh, was that the original? 50-50. 50-50, we will now, um, and we're gonna hopefully finalize this this afternoon, we will now get 75% of the net revenues and they'll get 25% of the net revenues, which will add an additional 203,000 coming in to the housing authority over that time, which in, in all would be 611,000. And then obviously when we move into Christmas too, I believe there's some development fees in that as well that will come into play. So um, that's what we're negotiating with them right now. We will need to come in with potentially somewhere between, and we've got to talk to LHDC about this and we've got to call a meeting for them, but we, we will, and when we say we, meaning LHDC, the city and LHA, will need to come in with um, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to a million dollars. Um, so what you can see, though, is when you look at the money we're pulling out of it, the return is actually really, really good in, in a narrow period of time. What we get out of it is 49 sub 50 percent AMI units, and we get nine 30 percent AMI units. Um, and, and so this is a little bit different because what we also heard from Chaffa is in terms of what the work that they do, what they're also seeing is an oversaturation of 60% AMI units. And so what we did here is a little bit different in that it's an income averaging. And, and with the income averaging, you bring in 70 and 80% units. But what it does is it actually gives you more sub 50% units than you would if you looked at the 60% AMI threshold that we've typically been looking at. And, and so it's a slightly different deal. Uh, we're getting more 50% below units. We're getting the FASA units. So that's what Kathy talked about earlier um, that we need to make up for the system. And we're adding an additional $200,000 of revenue coming in through this process. So we think it's um, a pretty good deal for the housing authority. And then knowing that we have the ability to assume management once stabilization is reached and that really works with us in terms of what we're trying to do now because the other project that's in the hopper and these are probably all going to be in construction around the same time is the element project at the suites which is sunset heights which is a fully supported project which we are supposed to be the managers of and so we're we're moving through all of those processes now um, and that's why the delay also worked on the Christman side. Christman is going through the 4% tax credit uh, for the uh, not, No tax credits. It would be all private activity bonds. <laughs> okay. Well, what's the 4%, the non-competitive that they're talking about? It, it's just non-competitive, period. All right. All right. So they're going through the non-competitive world. Um, Element is going through the... Um, the tax code, 9% in approval. And, and so we, we've had some issues we've needed to work through with DOH, but we think um, as of last Friday, we're in a pretty good spot on that one. So elements responding to them and we should hopefully hear in the near future. So we're gonna be in development on two fairly significant ads to our um, affordable housing 
product in our community. Um, here's where the world also changes. As we look at our ARPA funds, um, right now I'm asking um, the organization to look at needs, but we also know we have a rare opportunity that I'm gonna to talk to council about in that we have $15 million that we're still waiting on the treasury guidance that could potentially be used in the development of affordable housing. You don't have that much money coming in. And so it, it, we could theoretically then be in a position if we can utilize the ARPA funds and if council agrees with that from a policy perspective that we would then wanna start looking at the property that is north of, um, west of the lodge in Hearthstone that LHTC owns. HDC, correct? Yeah, they own that one. As a development project, but again, kind of talking about what we said earlier, the need for affordable family housing, um, looking at something like that, but really looking at some of those ARPA funds for potentially being the seed money in this. Um, and, and this is where everything, I think this is where the relationship actually really works and we're seeing things we didn't see. But how do we use these opportunities to increase the revenue stream for the for the housing authority? So one of the things you all may have heard us talking about, and I'm just planting the seed in, in your mind to start thinking about this. And we're gonna do the same thing with the council, um, hopefully in the near future or the, no later than the retreat. Um, what we're really seeing in this, this world of affordable housing and public-private partnership is the ability to generate a large amount of revenue and really stagger how we're coming in on the management side of this. And the more that we can use things like ARPA funding, inclusionary housing funding to, to do this work, um, the easier it becomes. And so something that, as we look at these projects that I'm starting to noodle around, is actually the first and main transit station. So if we can bring some of this money in to do a mixed use development with affordable housing in it, we now all of a sudden benefit a lot of things, but, but we're tied in there. And then if you can look at it and leverage it with a public private partnership model, then you can get even more housing in this. And so I wanted to use Chrisman and Element as an example of how we're starting to shift our thought process a little bit in terms of what makes the most sense um, long-term for the housing authority in being partners in these projects and, and what we can really get out of it because it does bring in, um, in many cases, a revenue stream for very little work outside of the front end of this, knowing that you'll assume a heavy lift down the road, which I think times better with where we are operationally. Kathy, did I miss anything? No, I just would add that there's other um, additional opportunities with the ARPA funding that some funds are going to the, the home consortium, um, which is like triple our normal um, allocation. So we're going to be meeting tomorrow, our folks are going to be meeting tomorrow about um, how to pipeline some projects for that. Those have to be used to assist homeless, those at risk of homelessness, um, victims of domestic violence, those kind of things. But that's something that some of the projects we already have in the works could um, maybe use funding for. Element's gonna need some additional funding. Um, so that might align with those goals. Um, and then the housing authority is going to be getting hopefully some vouchers. We're still not re well here by May 10th, how much and, and what, um, but that is a 10 year um, funding source for vouchers, again, really to help homeless, at-risk homeless, domestic violence, um, those um, really high-risk populations. So there's a lot of opportunities that are coming um, with the, the ARPA funding that we need to really make sure we are all aligned and have plans for everything and can hit the ground running as soon as um, we get the word and we start to get regulations and stuff like that to make sure everything's aligned and ready to go. All right, it's all very good news. Any questions, comments from anybody? Uh, one thing I wanted to ask too was, 
Could we get a budget to actual comparison at our monthly meetings? Is that something that could be worked up or balance sheet and income statement type thing? Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's been a process of getting the budgets uploaded, but they are oh, okay. almost they are almost done. <laughs> All right. I didn't I didn't know what that what that process was like. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, so yeah, we should absolutely. You want to see both the income statement and the balance sheet? That would be preferred. Yes. Detailed or summarized? This point, let's do both summary and detailed at this point, and then we can kind of see what sort of information we would like. Okay. Is there anything else from anybody? It's like a shorter meeting this time. <laughs> yes, Arlene. So this is gonna be sort of a comment and possibly a question. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity of being <laughs> the first car in line at the 21st railroad stop when the train went through the other day. And of course it blew its horn. That is extremely loud. Um, and now, Harold, I know you probably know more about this than I do, but I've tried to stay on top of following up on what's going on with that train horn. And I know that the city has received $4 million towards uh, quiet zones. And I know that there is a list in process right now that puts into effect when those quiet zones are gonna possibly be placed. Um, 17th and some of the ones downtown closer to Columbine Elementary are looking at this year, next year, they're looking at the rest of the downtown areas by the uh, school, schools, and also 21st. Um, I'm just wondering if I were somebody that were looking at Aspen Meadows, either the senior or the apartments over there, and I happen to be looking at a time when the train went through and that horn was going because this morning at six o'clock it was almost constant from 17th to 66. Um, is that a detriment and if it is can we let people know that something's going to be done about this within a year or two? Um, yeah we can definitely um, let them know the timing on this. Um, I'm trying to pull up the website so you we can see if I can give that to you all, but we'll provide you the information on the timing of the project. But yeah, we can let them know, you know, what's coming and, and how we're moving through the, the quiet zone process via the grants. If they have a question, we can get that information to, to Lisa on this. What's interesting is, and I'm and I'm gonna talk more globally about what I'm hearing just generally in the housing market right now, is um um, based on the demand, um, we're, we're actually not seeing that people are, are having issues with that, at, in, at least in terms of them coming into the marketplace. Um, what we're just seeing, the updates we're getting from the realtor community is it's people are still paying a lot of money to, to buy houses adjacent to the railroad. So in terms of market impact, probably not seeing that, but we can definitely let them know. Kathy? I just would add that, um, you know, that's one of the factors that HUD considers when we put any kind of HUD funding into projects, which both Aspen Meadows Apartments and Aspen Meadows Neighborhood had in it. Um, so there are um, uh, noise um, mitigating measures that we did take in the development of those with high efficiency windows and um, and it was far enough back from the the. I know it doesn't seem like it, but from HUD's perspective, it was far enough back from the, the tracks um, to mitigate that Aspen Meadows apartments um, more so than Aspen Meadows neighborhood. But there, there have been some uh, noise mitigating factors that have been taken um, into consideration in the design of both of those um, buildings as well to um, help um, mitigate those the noises. Oh, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and in terms of the length of the train, yeah, that's that's a different issue. And um, we've been having conversations with them in terms of public safety responses and things like that, but um, it's the railroad. 
but yeah, hopefully we're done in two years, which is better than we thought, better place than we thought we were going to be a year, you know, a year ago. And so with the grant money we've had coming in, we're actually um, excited to get started on all this work. Yes, Jean. Yeah. Um, if I may uh, go back to item 4A when we were talking about um, concerns for the city council retreat. Uh, Harold, I think in March you did a presentation to the LHA board where you envisioned LHA housing authority being um, a leader, uh, something that other housing authorities would want to emulate. And I would like to see your vision next month on how, how you perceive that and what needs to be done to accomplish that. Because we do need to, we do have some um, requirements, uh, which, you know, Kathy and Karen and I, you know, we have some absolute requirements, but then um, we should have some room to become the kind of housing authority that we wanna be. And I, I would like to have your input on that at the next board meeting. Okay. Okay. And just to you know to answer that question, so I'm going to be, so I'm going to I'm going to come into kind of the background of what um, for my training is the politics administration dichotomy as well. Yeah. And and so it really is the 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 council that sits the policy with you all advising them. And, and so at least coming into this conversation, I'm going to really want to hear from you all in terms of what you want to see. And, okay. and it may make it may make more sense to do it this way. We hear from you all as an advisory board and then as the council in the retreat and you and with you all joining them. And then I'm able to take that feedback from what you all want to see to then say this is then how we move to that next step. So if we could flip the order on it that makes more sense than what we're doing because I don't want to set policy in this. Right. Um, I wanna hear what you all wanna see and do. Mm -hmm. And then I wanna formulate what I think, what we think we need to do to, to be at that next level based on your, in the city, your advice to the council, mm -hmm. housing authority board and their decision on where they wanna go from a policy perspective. And, and okay. we can, and we can set that out and it isn't something that needs to be done tomorrow. You know, we're looking at, at three, five years right. that we could achieve. Yeah. Okay. I, I have no problem with that. Okay. And I think we can help set the agenda next week to kind of get you at some of those points with best practices and things like that too. Good. Good. Yeah, so if everybody could come ready for May to really just discuss what we see in the next three to five years in terms of uh, the Longmont Housing Authority, what we would like to see. So then, then we could give that to the city and then we'll talk about that during the, the city council retreat um, with the uh, Longmont House, uh, Housing Authority Advisory Board. Uh, any other comments, questions? I did forget one thing. We are going to be um, moving offices in, in the very near future. So we bring them in um, to the Civic Center with us. So we bring staff. We've been talking to them about this. Um, we'll obviously have the agreement with BCP for the facility. Um, we think it's important and that you've heard me say this and we had a conversation yesterday in terms of segregation of duties, all of these things, but then more importantly, just continuing to integrate the housing authority staff into the culture of the organization and kind of how we operate and how we work. Um, it, it, we just, we need to get that move done because um, A, it's really hard on Karen and Kathy and Tracy and Kendra and everybody else who are back and forth. Um, but more importantly, I think the sooner we can bring them into the fold with us, uh, we can more quickly continue this culture shift that we've really been working on. And, and I say that because if you would have asked me last May, would we be in April 
going into May, talking about two development projects, potentially a third, and, and just where we were sitting as an organization, I think I would have laughed. Um, we, we have, they have done, everyone has done a phenomenal job in terms of moving through this process and doing what we need to do. Um, and, and to just be able to have this conversation today about Christman element development in the future, um, we're probably six to nine months ahead of what I, where I thought we were going to be in doing this. And, and um, so they've been doing a lot of work, a lot of phenomenal work. Um, but we just need to take these next steps. All right. It's all exciting. These like new projects. Love it. Uh, any other, anything else? So, Otherwise, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Yeah, move to adjourn. Do I have a second? A second from uh, Arlene. So uh, next meeting is scheduled for May 18th. Uh, I'll see you guys all then. Have a wonderful day uh, shoveling your snow. Yeah.